Well, good morning. Uh, we are glad that you're able to join with us. Welcome to Oak Bend Church. And uh, we'll go ahead and kick things off with a few announcements. Um, a lot of cool stuff happening. I don't know about you, but I feel like summer is flying by really, really fast. Can't believe it's already August. School's going to be starting up soon. Um, so, yeah, speaking of school, we're going to uh, just a final reminder that tonight 
is our back to school blessing event and this is open to really the community but there's a bunch of churches that have come together that, that want to pray for the schools and leaders and teachers and everybody within the school system so that's going to happen tonight at the commodore building uh, i like to think of it as a place that's right across from oh dear diner in downtown perrysburg it's also where i went to junior high that they don't even do school there anymore that was a long time ago um, that's at 6 30 p.m and if you come, um, there's actually, for the, for the first, I forget, like 75 families that arrive, uh, there's uh, a gift for kids, or first 75 kids, I forget, something like that. There's a gift <laughs> for children, uh, the first ones to arrive. Um, we're planning on the event. It looks like there could be rain, but don't let that scare you away. Try to, try to come on out if you can, bring a lawn chair. We'd love to see you there. Um, it's gonna be a good time. And there's, they're gonna give coupons for uh, a discount on ice cream at Odier Diner. Um, you attend the event so that'd be cool but you have to use a coupon tonight vacation bible school final reminder that's coming up we're really excited i uh, just wanted to remind you that we are we have invited the um, police and fire to join us that day just kind of like they did last year so you get to spend some time with them we're really excited about that that'll be on wednesday at, from 10 to noon followed by a picnic lunch um, you can still register on the website as well and then worship night uh, is coming up soon on uh, Friday from 6.30 to 9 p.m. And we're, um, we're just excited that we have all these opportunities to gather together as a church. Contact uh, Jeremy Kramer if you need more information about that. And then one final thing, um, and this is really for the kiddos, even though I think some adults might get excited too. We have some puppets that are coming our way here really soon at the end of the month. And so we wanted to show you a quick video to share a little bit about that. Well, there you be, ha ha, sitting right here in that porthole over there. What a fine lot of land lovers you must be, ha ha. Hmm, you may not have heard the good news yet, but I'll tell you, I'm coming to your port of call real soon. Let me right. Who am I? Ah, Captain Redbeard is me, one of the most famous pirate captains that set sails on the high seas. I have a few stories to be sharing with you, and treasure to find with this new map that me found. Eh, shh, don't tell anybody about that. <laughs> and I am finding myself in need of a few new crew members. Aha, landlubbers to be Pacific, so you might fit the bill. Hmm, let me think about that. Well, you check the dates of when I'm coming your way and let down your ship's anchors so that you don't miss the big show that we're going to have for you. Maybe Dizzy the Bird can tell how good a tune I can sing. Oh, ho, let's see. Oh, he went out to sea. He never came back. <laughs> that was a good teaser. That is Sunday, August 27th, and that will be during Treehouse upstairs. Adults, we're going to ask that you stay down here. Um, I know some of y'all are going to try to sneak up there, but uh, yes, this is for the kiddos. So we're really excited. It'll be August 27th. So. If you're able to, would you stand and let's pray and praise our great God together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather, to know your love, and to be those who are sent to share your love. Lord, fill us up today with your spirit. Thank you so much that we can gather as a body to worship and praise our great Father. In Jesus' name.
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
so good. Thank you. Thank you for holding on to us, even when we let go. God, thank you for loving us, even when we don't love you back. God, thank you for caring for us so much that you bled it all out. Jesus, I pray that you would fill this space with your holy, holy presence. God, that you would use this time to draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray over all the children as they take off from here. Lord, be with their teachers and be with them. Help them to connect to you. We love you so much. We ask this all in your name. Amen. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I love, we love the fact that our kids are able to worship with us. So thanks for worshiping with our young ones. And 
sehr.
46. And they may put it on the board, but uh, you may open your Bibles to it. But uh, let's, let's read God's word together, and um, I will, I'll lead you in that. Psalm 46, I'll read the whole psalm. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? And I ask you to, uh, before the Lord, to present your heart and ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. Ask him to open your eyes to see what he wants you to see. And Father, we know that you love each one of us here and you long for us to love you back and to follow you. And so I pray that your, your work would be done this morning as we look at your word. Thank you for your word and for your people. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the world today, there is, there is fear. Fear is a very dominant thing in today's world. There's a lot of fear in America. There's a political fear. There's all kinds of different fears. But we live in a chaotic world, and it seems to be getting more chaotic. And uh, we're afraid of China. What are they up to? You know, and Taiwan's sitting there being threatened. There's a war going on with Iran, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And there's fighting in Africa. So there's all kinds of things going on in the world, and there's... It's really a dangerous place to live, and many, many people are afraid. Christians are afraid. So the, the Bible has a lot to say about fear, and this passage really is about fear, and, and it talks to us specifically about uh, ways to deal with fear, and, and so it hits home to my heart because I'm often afraid, and, and so I, I love reading about this. In fact, I've memorized this psalm because of that, but in this passage, there are three pictures, paintings, and the first painting is a painting of creation in chaos, creation in upheaval, and it, the Bible says here in Psalm 46, the, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake, but when the foundation that you stand on starts to shake, it's unnerving. I've been in an earthquake in California when I lived in Pasadena, and uh, it really gets you. <laughs> you feel it. Uh, my friend who was a missionary in the Philippines has been in an earthquake where he was on a field and he saw the ground moving like a wave, like a wave of water coming toward him and throwing him down. Can you imagine? And of course, we've just had a huge earthquake in Turkey and uh, with thousands and thousands of people dying. Uh, so the picture of creation in chaos and upheaval such that there's tsunamis and uh, the sea is, is upset and crashing against the mountains. That whole picture here is one that shakes us to the core of our being. The, the, this is a, a dangerous situation. This is a painting that is, is uh, disconcerting to me. And then there's another, another, um, another painting here of political upheaval. In verses 6 through 9, it says, Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. 
And then it says, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the earth. And so not, not only do we have creation in upheaval, people, we have political nations fighting each other and in upheaval too. So the world is, is, has, is in trouble. There's things going on that really are disconcerting. But in the midst of these two paintings of chaos and upheaval, there's this other picture, and it's a picture of peace and joy. Verse 4, four and 5, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. And so in the middle of chaos, there's this river that seems to bring gladness, joy, and peace. So what are we talking about here? And why, why, what is this? Um, it is interesting to me that God has these three pictures for us to see today and wants to help us understand how to have that peace in the midst of chaos. So I want to, I want to just give you a few takeaways that I've gotten from this passage. One is something that we Christians don't often incorporate in our theology, but God owns responsibility for the upheavals, for the tsunamis, the earthquakes. God's in charge of this world, and he's the one who designates that this nation is allowed to attack another nation. He, he uses the nations, and he's working and orchestrating earthquakes, famines even today, to accomplish something that I, that I know is about his kingdom. So God, God owns responsibility here. It says, it says here that the, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. My goodness, it's God that allows these things to happen. And if you look through the Old Testament, you see that God uses famines and other nations as his tools. The people of Israel, the northern kingdom, disobeyed God for generation after generation. And finally, God said, I've had it with you guys. I'm going to bring the Assyrian army in to discipline you. And he brought the Assyrians in, and they disciplined the northern nations. And then the southern kingdom rebelled against God, and God brought Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian empire in to discipline Israel and carry off captives such as Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So God uses, God's in charge of the, these things that happen. The second takeaway is that these upheavals are happening to us as Christians, to believers. When the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom of Israel, it wasn't just the wicked who were carried off into captivity and slaughtered. It wasn't just the wicked whose babies were dashed against stones. It was the righteous along with them. The whole group of people suffered, whether righteous or wicked. When, when the Babylonians took over the southern kingdom and carried off captives, it wasn't just the wicked that were carried off. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are examples of this. They were carried off and they were strong believers in the God of Israel. So when, when destruction and chaos come to a nation, all suffer, whether you're righteous or unrighteous. So it comes to all of us. I'd like to think that we would be protected, but not necessarily so. So as, the, as our nation sinks into deeper depravity, we can blame it on the wicked and think that we will escape, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, it, when God brings judgment, it comes on everyone in the, in the nation. So the, the next takeaway is that God himself has taken on himself the responsibility of being our refuge and strength. He desires to be our refuge and strength. As I look at the chaos in the world, as I look at the war in Ukraine, I I worked in the Ukraine in Odessa, which is being shelled right now. Uh, my wife and I were in Odessa when Katie was born. Katie was born in Odessa, Ukraine. 
And so I'm familiar with that town, and, I'm fam- I, and I, I know where the hospital is where Katie was born and everything. So that town is being shelled. And, and uh, I, look at, I look at these things, and it's, it's upsetting to my soul. I don't know if it is yours, but it's upsetting to my soul. And yet, in the midst of this, it is good to know that I'm not here pleading, God, please protect me. I wish you'd do this for me. I got to persuade you to do this to be my refuge and strength. No, he, he is already saying, Brent, I want to be refuge and strength. I've already taken this role. This is my role. I want to be your refuge and strength. You don't have to persuade me. So that's true for you too. Amen. It's a, good, it's a good word. It's a great strengthening word. This passage describes the Lord in verse 7 and verse 11 as the Lord Almighty. Uh, and in Hebrew, that's Yahweh Sabaoth, which means Lord of the armies. Uh, you know, they used to say, yeah, well, I, I forget what the King James translates this as, but this, this, this phrase is, refers to a warrior God, a God who reigns and has armies at his beck and call. And he does. He has angels at his beck and call. Our God can do anything. He is, he is the, a warrior God who's, who's there to be our refuge and strength. He's not, this Jesus of ours is not some limp-wristed Hollywood Jesus. This, this Jesus of ours is powerful. And has armies to call upon to defend us when he needs to. Right? So we're not, we don't have a protector who's our refuge and strength. Who's some wimpy God with angels that have halos on their head and look kind of peaceful and nice. The, this, this God is a powerful military God who's there to defend us and be our refuge. I like that. He says in verse 9, 6 to 9, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. It also says he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields of fire. So our God is about protecting us because of his own choice, and he's powerful in doing so. His power is overwhelming. The Bible says again and again, he cannot be thwarted. And in verse 6, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, and the earth melts. Uh, you cannot defeat God. He, his purposes will be fulfilled. And, and Putin can't stop that. Xi Jinping can't stop that. Our president can't stop that, right? The nations are there and they're in uproar, but he lifts his voice and they melt and his purposes will be fulfilled. The nations will hear the gospel and be saved. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have a God who's going to win the war, right? Uh, It's always nice to watch a football game, especially when you know the outcome is that your team won, you know, you watch a review of it and you watch the football game. Yeah, yeah, okay. The other team's winning, but I know the end, you know, my team. (laughs) So anyway, so. God, the, the other takeaway that I want to bring before you is that God is with us. An ever-present help in trouble. The reason uh, the river, the reason the river that runs into the city is a river that brings peace and gladness is because God is there. God is in the middle of it. The reason that we have this picture of peace in the midst of two pictures of chaos is because of the presence of God. Over and over and over again in Scripture, God tells us to not be afraid. He says to Joshua, for I am with you, and I will go with you. And he says to us in the New Testament, go and make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. So God's presence is the key to peace in any person's heart. And he is present He is our refuge and strength now, today, with you sitting right here, with cancer lurking in your spouse, with with your children not following Jesus, with whatever is bothering you today, Jesus is present with you. You can't earn his presence. You're not good enough and neither am I. We are all not good enough for his presence. That's not the issue. 
We love him and we come to him in the state that we are and he is present. He loves us each individually, no matter how righteous or unrighteous you've been this past week. He is with you and that never changes. Now and until you go to be with him, right now, Jesus, the Almighty, the Lord of the armies, is present with you. And he'll never leave you. Yeah, it's, just, it's worth clapping over. Thank you. So, uh, th- so God is with us. It says about the city, the river that's flowing into the city. Verse 5, God is within her. And throughout the Bible, the key to peace is the presence of The key to fighting anxiety and fear is the presence of God. And verse 7 and 11, it repeats the main theme. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now hear me, people. Uh, I've been a Christian for since I was a child. I was baptized in the Asuech River on the south coast of Papua, Indonesia. (laughs) My parents were missionaries, and I was born and raised among headhunting cannibals. (laughs) In, in Papua, Indonesia, and uh, till I was 18, then I went back to the States for college and so forth. But uh, it's been a long time. But these, these three relatives give me fits. One is worry, and then a close relative of worry is anxiety, and a close relative of anxiety is fear, and then you can couple that with terror, right? So... Uh, You can go to the full extreme of terror from worry over minor things to anxiety that plagues your soul to fear to terror. And these relatives have had way too much influence on my heart and life. Have they been bothering you lately? Um, This passage then is for you and me. We need this. Um, The trouble with me is that when I am afraid, when I'm anxious, when I start to worry, I want to turn to every resource possible but God. Crazy thing. You'd think I'd know better, right? I've been around a while, and I've been following Jesus for a while. You'd think I'd know better, but I still... When, when there's a financial crisis, I want to go look at my bank account and count my pennies and see if I've got enough to pay the bill, right? And then I, I'm worried if what's going to come in, is, am I going to have enough to pay the rent or whatever it may be? Kids in college, you know, this kind of thing. So I, I think myself silly about how to provide for myself, how to care for that which is causing me anxiety on my own. And so I turned to my bank account. We turned to others to help us figure it out. And then we throw on top of that because we're Christians, and so we want God to be a part. But, um, you know, uh, it causes me to want to control my environment. And the other, the other day, my wife said to me, Honey, you're too controlling. You're far too controlling in this family. I mean, I was telling my wife what lane to get into when she were driving, you know? (laughs) Okay, you know, you're going to turn left up here, honey. I know the way. I know the way. You're going to turn left. Yeah, yeah, I know the way. And so just way too much control in the family. And I I saw it. I began to see it. My wife helps me with these things. You know, and so I, I, I began to see a counselor just to help me out. The counselor said, tell me about your childhood. And I go, oh boy, here we go. She's going to bring out the child in me. So anyway, I told her, you know, I went to boarding school from age seven, second grade, all the way through high school. Is there a seven-year-old left among us here? No seven-year-old? Here's one right here, this little guy. Seven years old is a very early age to go off to boarding school for four months without your parents, then you come back for Christmas, then you go for four months without your parents, come back for summer vacation, and you're seven years old, you're about this high. When you get in trouble at boarding school with 100 kids running around and with just a few dorm parents, what can you do? You don't have any parents to turn to, do you? You don't have anybody to kiss you goodnight. You don't have anybody to love you up each evening when you come home from school, right? 
You're on your own. So I was seven years old, and I didn't know theology. Does a seven-year-old know theology? Does a seven-year-old know that God is present everywhere all the time and how powerful he is? No. So what do you do as a seven-year-old in boarding school with a hundred other kids around you and threats from other friends or threats, threats from the nasty guy in the class? What do you do? You find ways to control your environment. So that's what I did. I didn't even know it. But my my wife says, Brent, you read faces and you know what's going on in people's hearts before I do. And it's because I constantly had to be reading faces. I had to protect myself. I had to see, okay, this kid's getting mad. He's going to throw some punches. It's time to separate. It's time to get away. This person's unhappy. This person's sad. And I'm reading faces all the time because I've got to protect myself. And I grew up with this mentality developing in my brain and habits this thing of controlling my environment to the best of my ability, controlling others, controlling what happens next. And guess what? I can't control my environment. I can't do it. So what does that breed? That breeds anxiety, worry, and all that go with it, fear. And so, you know what? I had to take a look at my soul. I had to take a look at my soul. Not just stop telling my wife which lane to drive, you know? Not an outward, okay, I got to stop all these things. No, that, that wasn't working for me. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop my controlling behavior. So what do I do? Look at my soul. I had to look at my soul. And the pa- this passage tells me what to do. And it's, it's uh, just a, it's, it's a terrific verse. Verse 10. God says, be still. Be still. The American Standard Version says, cease striving. Be still, Christian." Be still and know that I am God. And God didn't ask me and doesn't ask me to try to stop all these controlling behaviors. He's not, he's not after the control of my behaviors. He's after, the, after my heart. And I began to realize through my answer that my view of God wasn't correct. I didn't see him as a loving God. In fact, my counselor said, Brent, how do you think God views you today? And I thought about it, and I said, well, I think he's disappointed in me. I think he's disappointed in me, because I don't measure up. I'm not a perfect Christian. I fall short, so... He's, he's disappointed. So, if I believe that God's disappointed in me, why would I ever want to go to a God like that for help? Right? So, I have been examining my soul and looking at God anew because God does, is not disappointed in me. I'm his precious child. And he, which of you, if your child has gone out and gotten muddy, dirty, and comes in and treks in the carpet, you're not happy with them. But I'll tell you what, you grab that little one and you love up on them, right? You love these children of yours. Well, if you love your children like that, how much more does God love us? So our Father in Heaven loves Brent Preston. (laughs) Believe it or not, yeah. (laughs) He loves Brent Preston, and he accepts me. He longs for me to love him back. And he longs for me to fellowship with him. And my counselor said, you know what? Most men that I deal with do not understand God's love for them. I don't know about you ladies. You're kind of a different... I'll have to figure you out later. But 
You men, God loves you, but we fail to understand that. The whole mindset of I've got to achieve for God to love me. Before God can help me with my anxiety, I've got to start to quit being anxious and then ask him, you know? So then, so no, but God is there loving us and, and wanting us to trust in his love and trust in his goodness and to give up the desire to control and figure out our own problems. You can't do it. I can't do it. So you know what God asks of you? To be still. Quiet your heart before God and say, God, this is beyond me. This is beyond me. I, I can't handle this. And I need you. I trust in your love. You care for me. And to accept and understand that love. And when I understand God's love and his goodness and his power that all go with it, it causes me to be able to let go. I don't have to work on all the actions. Because from my heart is coming a whole different mean, demeanor. I don't have to try to control my kids' outcome for my kids. I can let them go. Let God have them. And it, it affects all my behavior, but it's coming from the depth of my being. And it's, a, it's in that quiet moment where I lock into God and, and understand his love and appreciate his love and welcome him into my core being that I can have that transformation that comes out in my behavior. So I get with God alone and I'm still before him and I remind myself of his love, his goodness, his presence. I do that over and over again every day, guys. Every day I'm talking to God like that. So where are you today? Are you, are you struggling with fear, anxiety? I know you are. <laughs> I'll just tell you, you are. Unless you're not human. <laughs> if you're human and you're a Christian, you still struggle with worry, anxiety, and fear. So I know, I know you're at. I know where you're at. And what will you do with it? What will you do with it? Be still, the Bible says. Be still and know that I am God. I ask you to uh, bow your heads and take a moment to be still right now. So if you would, bow your heads and just uh, take time to be alone with your God right now in the middle of this congregation. And... Uh, I would like you to identify before the Lord right now one or two sources of anxiety or fear in your heart. What's causing your heart to lose its peace and joy? Can you identify those things? It's good to identify what's troubling our soul. Name those things to the Lord. And then I would like you to invite God into the battle that you have, whatever it may be. Invite him to be a part. Don't wait till you've got it figured out and then feel like a good Christian and come to him. Right now, in your anxiety, in your worry, in your pain, invite God into the battle. He loves you. He's present with you. Let God know you're not up to the task. And thank him for his deep, deep love and his presence with you at this point in the midst of this battle, in the midst of the chaos and the thrashing waves and the shaking earth. Thank him for his presence. He's here and he loves you deeply. Father, you've heard the prayer of your people. And I'd like to read to you in closing this verse from Isaiah 49, verse 15, 16. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Not likely, not likely. 
mothers love their babies in a special deep love. It is fabulous. He says, though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. This God loves you deeply. He knows your problems right now. Then Isaiah 54, 10 says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. As you go home today, I ask you to take these verses with you and, and think about them, meditate on them, and receive this river that brings peace and gladness into the depth of your being. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right.
Father, let us be still in your presence. Father, we thank you that you are here, that you love your people. That we have a place that we can come, a family of believers, and a Father who loves us. Whether it's shame or doubt, fear, worry, anxiety. That whatever we've walked in here with today, Lord, that we can put it, just lay it down. We have a tendency to pick it up, but Lord, can we lay it down and just leave it with you and declare as a church that we will receive your love no matter our current state. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to love the unlovable, to be a friend of sinners, to have a way to be in relationship with you. And maybe we haven't taken that step. And we can choose to do that today, that we would say, yes, I'm going to trust you, Lord. Put my faith in you. I'll receive from you what Christ did for me on that cross. I'll be a follower of you, Jesus. Thank you that you are our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in time of need. Thank you for loving us at our worst continuing to work on us through your process, chiseling away what you know needs to be broken off. God, we're grateful that you use broken vessels like us. And I think for so many of us wondering why you've even chosen to use us, why you have even allowed us to receive your love. But we will take it. And we are grateful for it. So, Father, we can declare together today as a church our love for you. And because of our love for you, we can say that we want to go and to spread this love throughout the world. Would you help us, Lord? Would you use broken people who love Jesus and hold on to the hope that he gives? that we can make it through another day, and that we can serve you, be loved by you, and share your love. Amen. I know I want to be sensitive to um, our students upstairs, but <clears throat> I was wondering if we could play a little bit longer. And then if you are in need of prayer, would you just come forward? You don't have to have anybody pray for you. But uh, our team will be ready. So we're just going to play for a few more minutes. And then, Scott, um, would you close us in prayer when, 